So on the doorstep, and I'm sure some of you also noticed this, people suddenly started asking, you know, what about the fact that he's going to have to be ruled by the SNP? You know, they're going to call the shots. What are you going to do about that? How's it? How's the bank going to deal with that question? And it was a bit of a perfect storm because, on the one hand, uh, sorry, you know, one of the things the bank was weak on was that he looked weak. I mean, I don't think he was personally, but he could not shake off that perception. So that was one problem. On top of that, of course, for our own benefit, Nicola Sturgeon was talking about how she's going to be. Uh, you know, dictating terms to Miliband. And on top of that, we are, uh, our own position on where we, what we would do with the SNP wasn't plausible. It wasn't possible for us to simply say we were never going to talk to the SNP, never work with them. It didn't sound plausible to the electorate, and we sounded like we weren't sure about our own position. And as a result of that, where you know, an attack where you suddenly say, oh, this guy's going to ruin the economy, or it's too far left, that doesn't stand up enough as a plausible accusation. But if you then say, but actually, this guy is going to be ruled by the P, he's going to be in their uh, grasp, that is a plausible argument to make. And that's what, and, and, and the problem was that because Miliband didn't look, didn't look like a strong leader, didn't project himself like a strong leader enough, it affected us at the last minute with people who previously said, I'm going to vote Labour, and then get to the polls and think, you know what, I'm not sure if I trust him to be uh, dominated by uh, Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP. So that leadership question was something that they never really dealt with and they never really grasped with properly. I mean, we all said quite a few times, one of the questions I always read with Razor and Mirabai, I mean, he invites us to a few. A uh, round table discussion. So, how are you going to deal with the Putin question? Which is that, you know, if someone said this guy's going to go on the world stage and he's going to have to deal with uh, and Putin, how are you going to deal with that? And you don't look like the kind of guy who can deal with that. And I said that to his face um, in a sort of, you know, nice way. Um, <laughs> and I said early on, I, I was pushing for a, a speech on foreign policy, a very aggressive speech on foreign policy, quite early on. But they didn't do one until much later on, by which point the Tories obviously made it about Libya and about the Mediterranean, Mediterranean crisis. So it didn't really work according to how they wanted it to work. Uh, and they should have dealt with that earlier on. I mean, they were thinking about doing a, a foreign policy speech after the Gaza um, uh, invasion of Gaza, but it never really got around to it. Um, for the, I don't know why, but that was one of the main problems. We never thought that leadership would matter as much and that Tories were very effective at using that leadership question in a way that was plausible. The second one was economic competence, obviously. And the problem here was not that, I mean, the problem was partly, of course, we didn't look economically competent because we had never answered the question about, you know, uh, did we overspend? Now, the problem was that there was lots of people within the, within the uh, Labour leadership who were saying, Let's not talk about the past, let's move on and talk about the future. So when this debate came up and said, what do we do? Why don't we uh, push back on the austerity narrative first? Um, uh, you know, austerity narrative, right, with much more uh, emphasis. Stuart Wood, who's one of the closest advisors to Miliband, said, look, we had a question, uh, we had a debate about whether we talk about the past or whether we talk about the future. And voters want to hear about what's happening in the future. And if we keep on talking about the past, we're simply reinforcing the negatives. If we talk about the future, it allows us to say, this is what we would do. We would, we've learned from our mistakes, and therefore we're going to focus on cutting the deficit, and this is where we're going to spend money on. But of course, you know, that never works. If you haven't answered questions about the past, then people are not going to trust you with the future. And they never really grasp with that, grasp with that. and partly because having a discussion about the past meant you had to push back at the austerity narrative and say, actually, we didn't overspend. We, uh, you know, deficit was manageable uh, and the run up to the financial crash, which no one saw, the Tories were pledging to match our spending plans until 2009. Uh, and then they withdrew after the crash. And of course, no one predicted the crash, especially not the Tories, who then, at that point, were arguing for less regulation. We should have had this debate in 2011, 2010 at least, but we didn't have that debate. 
because everybody wanted to not have that debate within the Labour Party. They wanted to move on. And of course, uh, that never worked for us. And it came back and bit us. Um, and the third mistake, I mean, actually the second mistake was in mind. I was arguing constantly for uh, having a discussion about the austerity uh, narrative, but nevertheless, it was, a, it was a decision made by the Labour leadership. And I think that's, uh, that's a mistake that they made. The third mistake I made, and in fact the Labour leadership had the same line of thinking, was that talking up UKIP would hurt the Tories more than it would hurt us. And it didn't work out that way. And the reason it didn't work out that way was for the reason I just mentioned earlier. A lot of people did go to UKIP from the Conservative camp, more of them from the Conservative camp than the Labour camp. But firstly, they listened to the Tory press in terms of coming back. But more importantly, because Cameron was able to raise this fear of, uh, you know, an Ed Miliband leadership being held to ransom by the SNP, they wanted strong leadership. And they felt, well, certainly people who were Tory switches, they certainly felt that actually it's too much of a risk. If they didn't feel like there was enough of a risk and that actually the Tories were heading for a fairly comfortable victory, I suspect they would have stuck with UKIP. But because they felt it was a close election and it was too risky to trust Miliband um, and let him in through UKIP, they switched back. But our UKIP switches, the people who went from Labour to UKIP, didn't switch back. So that was the third mistake we made, and we should have spent more time thinking about how to get those people back, how to switch it. But in places like Southampton, Itchen, where I went campaigning, there was a lot of people who were previously Labour supporters who switched over from um, Labour to UKIP, and they weren't coming back. You could talk about immigration, this is one of the reasons why the Labour leadership suddenly halfway through the, uh, around 2013-14 just kept on focusing on immigration. Because a lot of people from places like those were saying, look, these people are moved, going over to uh, UKIP, and they, they are worried about immigration. Um, and I, I mean, you know, I'll come back to immigration in a bit, but of course, with a situation like immigration, you don't look uh, credible unless you do something really drastic. Miliband had good policies on this, and every time I had a long conversation with a voter and saying, look, actually, this is what the policies are, and this is how we're going to restrict low scale immigration from Europe, they were like, okay, fair enough. But of course, you can't have that discussion unless you find a way of raising that issue with the public very strongly, otherwise it doesn't come through. So for years we spent talking about it, it was like a policy speech, and no one paid, no one paid any attention to the details. Um, so that was the third problem. That was the third mistake they made. UKIP uh, hurt us more than it hurt them. And that's going to be a big problem going forward. Um, so, Let's talk about the big contradictions and the big issues that the next Labour leader has to grapple with. I think that, I mean, the UK question is actually key for us, and in one sense, it encapsulates a problem that we've had over the last five years, which is about national identity. Uh, one of uh, Ed's uh, aides messaged me after we lost, and he said, we couldn't grapple with nationalism. And he didn't say Scottish nationalism, because in one sense it wasn't Scottish nationalism which killed us, it was English nationalism, which was a reaction against the SNP that really got us right in the last minute. And we neither had, a, we ne neither had an answer to Scottish nationalism, neither did, we looked, neither did we look strong enough on English nationalism, which meant people who were strong, who were strongly, uh, who were really worried about the SNP, but like we could not defend them because we were not nationalists. We would go into bed with the SNP uh, and work with them. And they felt the SNP, given they didn't know enough about them. I had friends on Facebook saying, oh, I don't want to uh, vote for Miliband because of the SNP. I was like, do you know a single policy of the SNP that you hate? And they couldn't name me a single one. But of course, the thing is, when the, when the enemy is unknown, then you can make a plausible scenario where they are risky without even telling them what's risky about them. And because people didn't know about the SNP, what it stood for, they thought, oh my god, this is like scary, and you know, Medline is going to be held to ransom by the SNP, so I'm not going to do anything. So we were stuck because, I mean, 
Ed made a speech in 2012 about English, uh, not English nationalism, but English identity and British identity. And he said, look, you have to go further with this. I've been a big advocate of national identity for quite a while. So we have to then grapple with this issue. And this issue has to be grappled with in two ways. And on one hand, you have to talk about English nationalism here and what English identity means over here. Because if you don't talk about that, people who have gone over to UKIP or middle class England are not going to feel that you have their interests at heart against, like if you do a coalition with the SNP, because that question will come up again. But even more, a question about, about identity is important even if we're dealing just with England, because within that context, a lot of people who do go over to the SNP do say, we don't feel like you've got our interests at heart. The whole discussion around metropolitan, London, liberal set taking over the Labour Party, it, it's not a question about economics. Miliband wasn't bad at the economic policies, in my view anyway, weren't that left wing. It's the fact that he could not culturally and emotionally connect with those people. And that is about cultural connection, it's about emotional connection with those people who think, I'm on your side, I'm one of you. And if you don't have an answer to that, then you're in trouble. And so we were in trouble for that reason. So the next Labour leader, if you're looking for one, well obviously you are looking for one. <laughs> the question you should be asking them is, what do you think about national identity? Where do you stand on that question? And actually, can we have an, an inclusive national identity which brings people here together? Because it's always traditionally been seen as an ethnic identity, as a racial identity. And I suspect a lot of uh, liberals feel that way, but so do some ethnic minorities feel that way. And so there's, a, there's an unwillingness to talk about it, but it doesn't have to be that way. My view is always that it's a, it's, you know, if we're going to talk about national identity, then it becomes a civic and a political identity. And if you have a narrative which is um, framed in, the, in that way, and, is, and it's broader, and it's inclusive, it can work for you. So that's the first thing they're going to have to grapple with. And John Denham is very good on this. Uh, John Cross has also been very good on this. Um, neither are going to play a strong role in you know, deciding who's going to be leader, because they've gone off and do, um, doing their own things. Um, John Denham is now no longer an MP, uh, but he's working on English identity. But if, I, I mean, I wouldn't say listen to them on this issue about identity, uh, especially English identity. And I think that uh, that's going to be key for us and key for the next candidate. The second one is, of course, is about tackling inequality. So Miliband, in my view, had had put his finger on the on the button, which is to say. Look, this economy is not working for working class people, ordinary people, low, lower middle class people. It's an economy that works for uh, people at the top, and that's about it. And the Labour, uh, you know, as much as we talk about aspirational voters, the Middle England, you know, you'll hear a lot of that over the next uh, few months, uh, years. Um, they have to talk about how they're going to lift working class people, how are they going to lift lower middle class people? Those are people who've gone over to the UK because they're pissed off with their state of affairs. And they don't feel like our politicians can offer them something, can offer them a better life. You have to bring them back while also holding on to middle class people um, you know, who don't think that economic inequality is one of their bigger issues. But, in the, I mean, I, I wrote this like uh, two, three days ago. The thing about Miliband was that he was the first guy to say, this is a problem for us. The Labour Party has to deal with the fact that the 19, uh, the Thatcher settlement and the Blair settlement has failed us. And effectively, we've been living in a housing bubble for the last 20 years. That's how people feel better off, because their houses are not well. Not because their wages are rising as fast as they used to in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even a bit of the 80s. Not because uh, you know um, they feel uh, you know empowered at work, 
but because assets are going up. And that disproportionately helps people who have more assets. So the next labor leaders, regardless of who they talk about reaching middle England, obviously they really want to reach middle England, there's not getting away from that. They have to talk about how the hell we're going to lift those people at the bottom. That is not an issue that will go away. And that's not an issue that we should, within the Labour Party, let go of. We should always hold our leaders to account and say, what are you going to do for the vast majority of people who are not feeling better off? You know, um, and that's not going to be an easy task because the problem is that to deal with that real structural inequality, that settlement of the last 30, 40 years, is going to require a lot of change. That means someone's going to have to be radical. Because if they're not being radical, if they're not saying these are the big changes that we're going to make to the economy to help working people, then frankly, we're wasting our time. If you get into, if you get into power and then maybe you could you know, do a U-turn and then sort of decide to do something else and focus on inequality. Um, but they kind of have to start talking about that now. And so you have to hold them to account and say, well, why aren't you talking about that? radical changes that we need, the big board changes that we need to our economy uh, to make this happen. The third problem is, uh, the third big uh, issue I think that the Labour Party has to grapple with is um, our social issues. So, I mean, I, I don't think the Labour Party is, um, you know, going to move away from the equality agenda, but we do have an issue where our base now are, is uh, mostly concentrated around big cities. And it's not just London, but it is, uh, you know, even in the Midlands, up north, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, those are the areas that we are doing well in. This is not just limited to the UK, this is the same across the United States. You know, all the democratic base is, is focused on cities. They have the, the, the in fact, most of the mayors across the United States, the, big, uh, the mayors of the big cities are all Democrats, whereas all the governors of the big states are all, mo most of them are Republican, for again, demographic reasons. Now this change is inevitable, but the problem for the Labour Party is that the people, the number of people in the cities are not big enough to outweigh the number of people in the rural areas, or small towns, yet. And I think we'll get there eventually, but that demographic problem is still there for us. So we have to, on the one hand, keep the, the, the base happy, the metropolitan base happy, who is comfortable with liberalism, comfortable with um, you know, banging on about equality, uh, comfortable with uh, talking about rent controls, uh, you know, those kind of issues, uh, versus the kind of people that we need to get who are not. And those kind of you know, uh, and those issues don't really match to them. So that rural—I mean, it's a bit of a generalization—but the rural-urban divide within the Labour Party is a problem for us. I mean, it's a problem for the Conservative Party too, because of course in London they've been slowly, slowly pushed out, and in all the metropolitan areas they've been pushed out, and that's a big long-term demographic problem for them. But for now, it's a problem for us. Over the long term, it'll be a problem for them. So you have to ask them how they're going to deal with that contradiction. Um, so that, those three things, um, I would say, are the big issues that any Labour leader has to grapple with. And uh, you know, you should try and hold them to account on that and ask them what exactly they're going to do to deal with this problem. So, Let's now go on briefly on to the candidates. I'm not taking a side here, by the way. Um, again, because I don't think it's going to help the candidates uh, rather than anything else. Um, I think the one thing that you have to look for in each of the candidates, or you should be looking for in each of the candidates, is who can spot their weaknesses and deal with them quickly. Because we said this to Malabat. We said, you've got a problem in the way you look and the, the image that is being, I mean, not like physically look, but I mean the way you're projected. <laughs> <laughs> the 
the way you the way you come across to people and the way you <laughs> sorry the way you uh, you know the fact that you look like a, a, a metropolitan uh, London um, sort of a geek you know as Jeremy Paxman said and you can never really shake that off and that didn't really work and so so the person who wants to be the next leader has to know what are their weaknesses and how do you, how do they deal with them quickly enough. So I suspect, let's go, I mean, go briefly to some of the candidates. Andy Burnham's biggest weakness is that he will look like he's uh, old school left a bit. Um, he doesn't look like he could, go, he could handle the Putin question yet. I mean, I think he could, probably could do that, but he has to show whether he recognizes that's his problem. And that, um, as someone said, you know, we don't, we're not picking a Labour leader, we're picking the next Prime Minister. And that's what we have to look for. So Andy Burnham's issue is going to be, how can I look strong in foreign policy? How can I project myself in a way that makes me look much stronger um, than I do now? And can he deal with that? Can he recognize that issue and then uh, you know, deal with that negative? Um, and for some reason, people think that he's uh, bad at quality. Um, I, which I don't know where it's come from. I remember in 2010 when I was ringing around all the candidates and asking them whether they endorsed uh, supported gay marriage. Uh, Andy Burnham, who's known for being traditionally conservative only because he's, um, he says he's a Catholic, actually uh, came to me second uh, early on and he said, yeah, I'm fully behind it. Whereas Ed Miliband was the last person to endorse. And only initially they said, um, that they were not sure about the issue, they'd come back to me, and then once every, all the other candidates had said that they supported gay marriage, then quickly they came back and said, yeah, yeah, and supports gay marriage. So, I think this criticism that someone made about Andy being very too socially conservative, but I'm not sure if it stacks up, but that aside. So Liz Campbell, I think Liz Campbell is a really strong candidate. I think the issue for her would be, can she show that she is, uh, can, uh, standard layer of publicity and hostile questioning and um, and the fact that people will say you don't have enough experience, you've only been around for five years um, you weren't really in the shadow cabinet either, you didn't sit on the cabinet table um, she was a shadow minister but uh, not in the cabinet I believe yeah, she was in the um, so that's going to be her main problem lack of experience, not really having much layer of publicity um, and being slightly uh, it's not very clear exactly what her agenda is, as in the way she stands in the party. Everyone's basically saying, I'm for aspiration of voters, that doesn't tell you much. Um, so I think she's going to have to spend some time defining herself more. Um, but for the people who've worked with her, I say that she's a really strong candidate, and when she announced uh, her candidacy, I thought she was quite clear. Um, uh, and, and speaking, standing quite strong. So I don't think she will have a problem standing strong, but I think she will have a problem um, uh, if she gets a lot of negativity and negative attacks. And then, then the thing is, you have to watch whether she handles them uh, well or not. Um, moving on, uh, there is uh, Yvette Cooper, Chuka Amuna, and today May Cray. Um, so Chuka, I think Chuka's biggest problem is the UK problem. And people will say, undoubtedly, whether he can attract and hold our front in the north. Because he's London, he's metropolitan, he looks like a slick uh, <coughs> London candidate. His race is going to work against him, I don't think anyone can deny that. Uh, I might as well say it because everyone's thinking it. Uh, but I suspect that within the party, no one's going to want to say that, but they will think it. So he's going to have to figure out a way of dealing with that. And the problem for me is that does Chukka understand English identity? Is he comfortable talking about it? Because he never has. What is his identity? How does he feel he can connect to people who feel like the world is changing too much and they don't feel a sense of connection to their country? in the way that Labour used to talk about those terms, and it do doesn't anymore. And can Chukka be able to deal with those people and bring them in emotionally? Because this is not just about having a set of policies which appeal to Middle England. 
If they wanted those policies, they could go to the Conservatives. It has to be about emotional connection. And I think Chuka looks prime ministerial, that's not his problem. The problem is, does he look like he has an emotional connection? Can he have an emotional connection with those people? Um, and, you know, that's his negative that he, I think he's going to have to do. Uh, and Yvette Cooper, I think, finally, I think her negatives would be A, too associated uh, with their goals. Uh, she can't help that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, I don't think she is able to project herself as strongly as she could do potentially. Uh, for a person who was in, in the Home Office brief, um, and you know, actually, Home Office mini uh, shadow, Home Office people in the past have said crazy things. She did. She wasn't that draconian on a lot of issues. So I respect that. Um, but I also feel like. She doesn't have enough of a presence um, within the media, and I, sus and, and I worry that if she does want to um, be uh, look, like she wants to look like a prime minister, then she's going to have to have more of a presence. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, she she will inevitably be asked the question about. I mean, she, on what I want today, she was asked about. You know, did Labour spend too much? And those questions are inevitably going to go to her because of her closeness to Ed Balls. So, again, she didn't really have a strong response to that. So those questions are going to come to her, and so she's going to have to find a strong response to that because she's been seen as the most senior candidate um, within the Labour Party. Um, and they're going to go to her from the past, and they're going to say, well, you were the person who was near the top um, throughout, so why can't you answer this question? And also, if she doesn't look like she can project herself strongly, then she's going to have real problems looking prone to her. Um, and I think the same applies to Mary, who I think is really good, and she's very clear on TV, she's very strong, um, comes across as quite nice. Um, but again, I think her the setback for her would be people saying, but does she look prime ministerial? Does she look like she could stand up to Putin? That's basically what foreign policy comes down to these days. You know, is she going to take a hard line on ISIS? You know, and, and to a certain extent, all of them are going to have to take a very hard line on all these issues. There's no getting away from that. None of them, other than Chukla, have to worry about looking like they can be on the international stage and look strong. And that's my perception anyway. I mean, you might all disagree with me, so it's fair enough. You can disagree with me uh, now if you want to. But basically, I think those are those, you know, the, the issues. And I would say to you, don't look at the person who, you know, that you agree with the most, or the person that you feel like in your heart you want them to be leader. Look at the person who knows what their negatives are knows what will be used against them and works to, to dispel those issues first. And, that, and then you have a candidate who is flexible, adaptable, uh, knows, is self-aware of the problems that will come their way and can quickly resolve them. That's the candidate, that's the kind of candidate we need. <coughs>